Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the New Orleans Jazz Museum for a new series being launched in co cooperation, coordination with the museum and the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. The title of the series is Talking Jazz with Fred Caston in Concert. Uh, I'm Fred Caston, and we're delighted you could join us here this afternoon for the first of this new series. And um, for almost a decade, maybe over that uh, now, I've had the privilege and pleasure of hosting uh, just an interview series here at the Jazz Museum for the Jazz Park. The uh, little thing called COVID-19 interrupted those live <laughs> performances. We migrated some of that to Zoom and the web and have done those things, but uh, um, one of the things that um, that happened during, during those Zoom performances, uh, Zoom interviews, and also uh, during the performances that first decade is often the, the players uh, were uh, interested in, if they were instrumentalists, say, that was comfortable doing a solo piece, they'd play a piece at the end of the interview. We always enjoyed that and thought, well, you know, if we can ever get the funding to kind of expand that, it'd be nice. And finally, we have gotten the funding to expand that, so we have now in this series an opportunity to not only do an interview, but to offer a chance for artists to have a duo or a trio performing with them and uh, mix the talk and the music for, for your pleasure and uh, information. And uh, so we're very pleased to have you here and excited to have this, this new series underway. So excited, in fact, that I hauled myself out of the uh, tub, uh, the, uh, the tub of crepe race I've been soaking in the last two years <laughs> and uh, unhooked myself from the IV of Prevagen and hope I could remember enough to ask these guys some good questions. And so here we are, ladies and gentlemen, with two, two great, uh, great artists, uh, uh, one of whom has known the other one his entire life. And uh, in fact, both of whom have known the other their entire lives. Uh, on my immediate right, your left as you, as you listen, uh, is a young man who has become one of New Orleans' most accomplished, versatile, in demand, and uh, uh, wide-ranging bassist, uh, please welcome Mr. Martin Mazikowski. <laughs> and that uh, fellow he's known all his life is his dad, <laughs> a great guitarist, composer, and educator, just in the last couple of months retired from about uh, 30 years, wasn't it, uh, Steve, uh, uh, more or less? Yeah, 33, if you, 33 if you count you. the three years of, as an adjunct. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, yeah. Uh, a, a long tenure and a very successful one at the University of New Orleans and the Jazz Studies Department, which he, he uh, led for about the last 18 of those mm -hmm. years, right. Mr. Steve Mazikowski. Thank you. Thank you. And these guys are going to play a couple of tunes for us to get us started, and then we're going to start the talk. So, gentlemen, take it away.
Thank you very much, and welcome. Uh, that was a song that um, I think in the, some of the times when Martin and I, when we were, he was younger, and uh, I, was, uh, I was still old at that time. <laughs> we would get together and play, and that's one of the favorite ones we'd like to play. It's called How My Heart Sings by Earl Zinders, made famous by the great pianist Bill Evans. And uh, should we play um, Blue Bop? Yeah, we're going to do, um, I've been playing with a, uh, a band for many, many, many years, probably. We consider ourselves the, uh, the Rolling Stones of jazz in New Orleans. It's called the Astro Project. <laughs> we've really been around for a long time, but uh, I do a lot of composing for that band. And uh, this is a song we're going to play. It's called Voodoo Bop. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Steve Mazikowski's composition, beautifully played by Martin and Steve Mazikowski. Now we had a waltz and some voodoo. I think we're ready for some talk. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, one of the, uh, the, the things that um, I love about New Orleans is the fact it is such a musical city. Music just oozes from the pores of everyone and from everything here, it seems like. And uh, we particularly uh, take a lot of pleasure and pride in our musical families of which the Mazakowskis are certainly a, a prominent one. Uh, uh, I remember, Steve, you talking about, uh, though your mom was not a professional singer, she sang around the house a lot, even appeared sometimes on Pinky Vodakovich, right. Johnny's uncle, That's right. radio show. That was some of my first uh, recollection of, of, of hearing her sing around the house that she, she cleaned. And, um, and yeah, she, was, she, she could... She could carry a tune she was really good she was a good dancer too <laughs> everybody seemed like the dance back then as well but um yeah i was also very uh influenced by the neighborhood um like I, at that time of course we had no air conditioning i grew up in the last house on magazine street 7049 magazine street which is uh uh has been demolished i, I think because the uh, the termites got got, <laughs> got tired of holding hands <laughs> But, but uh, anyway, so, you know, you, you left all your windows open and uh, you would hear everything that was on the street. And um, lo and behold, about three houses down was the Paul Crawford uh, jazz band. And I would hear them rehearse. And, you know, that was my first exposure to it. Jazz band would sound like. I didn't know it was jazz. It just sounded like music to me. And then also... Uh, you know, going to parades and hearing parade music and hearing hearing the rhythm of the of the the, the, ba the bands that were playing in the parades and stuff like that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, influences just happening in air in New Orleans. And um, I should also explain my name because you know when you say Masakowski, not many people relate. That doesn't sound like a really you know traditional Cajun name <laughs> or <laughs> French name or whatever, but. Uh, my father um, was stationed in New Orleans during uh, World War II, and he was from Wisconsin, and uh, he met my mother, and my mother was sort of working for, I guess, doing volunteer work for the war effort and stuff like that, and they met at that time. So uh, when people hear that, uh, and they got, you know, the rest of this history, I guess, but okay. the, uh, when they hear that name Masakowski, I, I always remind them of the, that the, uh, the, the movie Streetcar Named Desire, you know, and Stanley Kowalski, you know, right. <laughs> Marlon Brando. Stella! Or, or just you know. your middle name, Alphonse. Yeah. Alphonse, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that might get the job done as well. Yeah, so yeah, I was, I was definitely influenced by uh, my mother. She, was, she had the, the musical talent and family for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Martin, uh, mm -hmm. obviously your, your, both of your parents were, are, you know, your mom is a, a great pianist, mm -hmm. um, and your dad is, a, you know, a multi-talented multi musician. Uh, what what are your early memories of music? Well, I guess uh, I grew up in a generation where we had air conditioning, so we didn't have <laughs> <laughs> nothing from outside. <laughs> so L we didn't lucky actually. You. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lucky me. We didn't necessarily have have to have the windows open all the time, although I mean, we could. Uh, but alternatively, uh, hearing it's like early recollections. I mean, other than 
them playing in the, around the house and obviously practicing and there was always a grand piano yeah. in our house and my mother uh, practicing um, I would I think some of my most prominent memories of, he of hearing my dad mixing albums uh -huh. Uh -huh. uh, Astro Project albums oh, and things right. like okay, this yeah. because uh, when you go into uh, you know that that kind of production of, of such right. al of such albums you have to you know hear the tunes over and over oh, again and just you know fine tune the mixes and stuff like this so it's like uh, i didn't really have a question or why that song has been on repeat for, <laughs> for the last three hours you know <laughs> um but that probably uh you know got got some ingrained yeah. in my memory N not only that but also going to uh performances i don't know how young i was the first time they took me to jazz fest and mm -hmm. things like that so almost feel like growing up inside snug harbor seeing mm -hmm. astro project perform and and, o and other things like that were you immediately drawn to music or was it just something that took a little time Not, to develop no actually <laughs> <laughs> but you started on you kind of started on drums i remember yeah well, i mean when i was uh, 14 or so i started on drums but yeah. i remember much earlier i mean, it was probably eight years old or something like this and i just had this feeling like i, I, I said in the back of your car like mom dad i don't like music <laughs> <laughs> no, i wish they'd yeah, have taped right, right. that <laughs> <laughs> i guess uh <laughs> they just didn't listen to me <laughs> but uh, uh so so you had other other interest uh i know you were interested in visual art exactly so i kind of spent most of my you know early childhood doing uh visual art what what uh, was your medium there Mostly like um, graphite, pencil, and black, black and white drawing kind of thing. Although I was in art classes in school and doing different different mediums, mm -hmm. um, which helped. But uh, when I was, let's say, I mean, I was, I guess, I was like thirteen years old, um, and that's when I would start the first uh, jazz band or start my the, f the first musical influence. I was in school at Lusher Middle mm -hmm. School. Um, and somehow they convinced me that I would to, to, to do mo both music and art. And I could do that, like kind of split my electives up. Uh -huh. uh, and I was gonna maybe start playing bass then, like electric bass, but I was never super drawn tor towards electric bass. And then there was already an electric bass player and uh, everyone said, oh, she's such a good bass player. So I was like intimidated. And I was like, all right, I'm not gonna play bass then. Uh, and the, the band, the teacher uh, was like, all right, well, we don't have a drummer right now. You want to play drums? <laughs> oh, yeah. So just by chance, I started uh, playing drum kit as like kind of my my main first musical uh -huh. influence, which I think really influ influenced me a lot, um, you know, rhythmically in general. And right. I kind of uh, even today, kind of I'm more drawn to the uh, um, rhythmic side of music. Let's say. Yeah, what, uh, having spent a good bit of time in Eastern Europe with a lot of the musics there that are much like here, uh, have that rhythmic drive mm -hmm. and uh, certain feeling, of course, growing up here, then uh, that, that makes sense. What about uh, a, um, an instrument uh, other than drums? Uh, I know you, you do play some woodwind instruments now. Did, is that, did you get any training on those in those days? Well, uh, so like, let's see, after, after drums, um, it was only for about a year. And then just the summer before high school, I, I was, uh, my sister started dating a bass player, ah. Nathan Lambertson by chance, <laughs> uh, who's still around in New Orleans, or he lives outside of New Orleans, but plays around here. Um, and he would come and leave uh, his bass at our house. Ah. And that was like the first, you yeah. know, the first thing that, that kind of really influenced me. It was the first time I got to see it close up. It was at home. I could like sneak upstairs and unzip it really carefully. I act as like, I could, I, no one would ever notice, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I asked, you know, I asked them. I was like, "Hey, you think I can get a, you know, play, start playing bass?" Or they, also, they uh, convinced me it would be easy to get into the New Orleans Center for Creative Art, NOCA, uh -huh. playing bass because like everyone needs a bass player or something like this. So right. um, I asked them, and he he got me. They were willing to buy me an upright bass, my mm -hmm. first bass, which happens to be a um, w one of Richard Moton's old bass. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Great New Orleans bassist. Yeah, that was the the, fir the first bass that I kind of grew up on, oh. and I lo and behold did get accepted into 
uh, Neuron Center for Creative Art, and that's kind of how the ba base really How began. that came to be. Well, well how, how did you like it then at that point as you started to get into it? What were you? Uh, I, it was this fascinating big thing, as it still kind of is. I mean, I, I think it's just kind of beautiful as like a, as a large violin, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, um, and it's still as daunting today as it was then <laughs> of, of an instrument. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but then, let's see, a year, only a year later, Hurricane Katrina uh, hit, and that's kind of what led me into woodwinds a little bit and, uh. and all other, other directions, um, because we evacuated to um, Houston, to Houston Galveston. and eventually Galveston, um, Texas. And some, I wasn't able to take my bass, but the people who hosted us, they had a clarinet in their attic. Uh -huh. and I was just like, okay, let me just toy around with this for a couple of months that we were evacuated and right. that was fun and then I, I had to you know return it as we eventually returned to New Orleans and then I was kind of that left a bug in my ear and yeah uh, discovered bass clarinet as an instrument that existed and I was so excited because I was a bass I was a bass player and there's a bass clarinet and then yeah, right, right. He, they were again yeah, he's always been drawn to like low instruments you know in <laughs> fact he, he built he came by home once he went to Home Depot and bought this giant piece of EVC pipe, and then so what? What is that for? You know, and he made this giant. I don't know what you call it. You know, contrabass PVC I mean, pipe. <laughs> technically, a, a sub, sub, sub contrabass recorder. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, Something but, like a didgeridoo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And then even even the bass clarinet, you tried to extend the range lower, like you made the pipe. Yeah, lower. I mean, I guess I've always been interested in just not necessarily bass instruments, but unusual instruments uh, or something right. that are ab abnormal and just. It just happens to be that like these instruments are not uh, at the the front of the bandstand, so they are a oh little right. bit uh, a little bit uh, unusual. And then also the time of like kind of relatively early internet, you can start exploring different things, and that's when I you know discovered the bass clarinet. And there's also like sub contra bass clarinet or like recorders, a whole line of like block flout recorders that also yeah. have a bass version and contrabass version and sub contrabass versions. <laughs> so music is beginning to become a, a, a much more uh, uh, passionate uh, pursuit for you at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, at, at, at that time, uh, were you still, it was kind of sold to you as well, you can do both. Were you still doing your visual art there? Well, I, I a l uh, to a certain extent, but but definitely less and less. I had originally applied to Noko for visual art, and I was accepted in that, but it was mm -hmm. kind of like a last minute shift change that I decided to go to for go to music, music instead. Um, so I did com continue drawing and painting, and I mean, that eventually kind of led to photography as, a, as, as another um, side hobby, let's say, and I, s I still do a lot of uh, visual art today, whether it's like graphic design or or hand drawing or coming to be the season of pumpkin carving. Oh, Lord. The but pumpkin you know, lattes I and the pumpkin carvings, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. I remember, you know, one of the things that uh, kind of just from a you know, from a parental point of view, you know, when we evacuated for Katrina, you know, we also tried to find a... Uh, a base for you, right? Right. We, so you find this crazy base that you That's could practice right. on, but um, everybody was everybody was trying to scramble to get their kids in school right. in, in Texas, and we didn't do that. But he just, uh, to me, so he basically stayed out of school for a year, and then we eventually moved back, you know, came to New Orleans after about a month or so, so we can get back in our house. But um, um, basically, that year is where he just thrived in terms of like he just spent all his time like practicing the instrument. You know, right. he didn't have I hate to say it the diversion of school to get in, get in right. his way. You know, so I, <laughs> but so he really uh, he really exploded. You know, in that year, so uh -huh. he wasn't like wasting time. He was just I mean I guess you were just drawn to it, but you seemed like you mm -hmm. you really developed mo uh, most of your uh, skills on the bass during that y year of uh, Katrina. You know. They put in the kind of time that uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about, those 10,000 hours of time on task. Oh, right, yeah. That's uh, right, now, yeah. that may not have occurred in those in that year, but he started getting that kind of pursuit. Right, right, right. Of, of, and music, it sounds like, was really becoming much more uh, of a central uh, pursuit for you at, at that point. Yeah, I mean, uh, it seemed... Uh, 
you know, transcribing, which I think is one of the best things you can do as, uh, as far as practicing music, that it wasn't like a chore, it wasn't a job, it wa I don't know what, it was just kind of like, oh, ha something I mm -hmm. have to do or something, I don't know, it's just something that yeah. was part of it. Um, in I guess in, in terms of learning it or learning a new language that I was excited about. There was actually, um, you know, this, this bassist I mentioned earlier, Nathan Lambertson, he had given me a, a like a, an MP3 player before I even knew what MP3s were, you know, like how do you get these music onto this thing? And he preloaded it with some music that uh, happened to be very influential. Mm -hmm. One of one was an album of uh, um, of they call it a bass orchestra, but really it's six six basses. Um, Le Orchestre de Contrebasse oh, right, yeah. from France, and I didn't even know the title of the 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 band or the the, the orchestra. I only was says track one, track two, tra you know, right, <laughs> six right. bases, track one, track two. So right. it took me many years to figure out actually the roots of who these people were, this music. Um, but that had a big influence. Even then, there was a lot of a uh, odd meters, kind of Middle Eastern sounds, right. unusual techniques, playing super high in the range of the instrument. It sounds like uh, like oh yeah, like weird. Bird call Eve effects, uh, percussive effects, um, all done on bass, and 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 all I had was my imagination to try to figure out oh. what they were doing, yeah. and it kind of became almost a daily uh, practice routine to play along with the entire album. You know, it was like an hour and twenty minutes or something like this, and I just like would play. It wasn't necessarily the lead part the whole time, or just like play a part of this album right. as I uh, interpreted it the, uh, yeah. for the entire album. That was kind of like my warm up. Well, uh, it, it's like uh, you got from uh, Nathan something, uh, a sort of technique that uh, Steve has used, I know, and uh, Ellis Marcellus uh, used all the time, is it gives somebody something that you know will let them explore it on their own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you took the ball and ran with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. got, a lot out, got a lot of mileage out of that. Right, yeah. Well, uh, you went on, uh, and we'll talk in the next uh, talk segment here to um, study music here and in Europe and do a lot of work there while your dad was getting involved with uh, teaching uh, here more and more. We'll talk about that uh, next, but let's have a couple more tunes, what do yeah, you say, yeah. guys? Sure. You want to do a little uh, thing for you know, uh, Maybe not yet. We can okay. talk about it first. And then I'll <coughs> this is another one we like to do. Um, by the great uh, pianist composer Cedar Walton. It's called Bolivia. <laughs>
We're going to do a tune now by the, another song that I wrote for. Well, actually, we're playing with the Astro Project, but I, I did a project, uh, got commissioned to do a project, I guess should say, um, about six, seven years ago, to write some music inspired by the book Confederacy of Dunces. And uh, I, I uh, collaborated with a, a lyricist named uh, Jay Griggs, J. Miles Griggs, and wrote a bunch of music. And um, the one we're going to play now, just as an instrumental, uh, is about one of the characters in the book uh, named Angelo Mancuso, who was kind of like the crazy cop that uh, patrols the French Quarter for, you know, for wrongdoings and, and whatever. So this one's called Mancuso.
ladies and gentlemen, Steve Mazikowski's Mancuso. And Bolivia from Cedar Walton. Before that, um, I recommend highly you check out the Mazikowski Family Band CD that has more music that Steve wrote in, as inspired and commissioned uh, to write about the, uh, the characters of Confederacy of Dunces and the, uh, the city that bred them. Uh, and uh, that's Nino Escape. Right, right, right. That's right. Yeah. For years, the uh, city of New Orleans um, web address was City of No. We had no police department and no fire department. And no potholes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, sorry, they finally changed, uh, changed, they changed it to City of Yes, I think. Yes, we can. Yes. But uh, so look for um, No, N O, that is, escape. Yeah, right. right. As, uh, as essayed by the Mazikowski family band that includes these two guys. Martin Mazikowski, Steve Mazikowski, and Sasha Yeah, Mazikowski. Sasha's not here today. She's on her way to uh, San Francisco to play with Nick Payton. So she's in, oh, uh, yeah. She, yeah, yeah, they so, so. got started doing some work together yeah, during the pandemic. Yeah, there's a new uh, band pandemic. called uh, uh, New World Order. What do you think about that? <laughs> how how uh, topical. The, the New World Order? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, or Order, yeah, right, anyway. as the case may be. Yeah, right. Well, well, that's that's great. She's just been uh, yeah. exploring all kinds of interesting. Oh yeah, she's things. doing she's doing really good. I'm I'm now known as uh, Sasha Mazikowski's father, <laughs> <laughs> and soon to be known as Martin Mazikowski's, <laughs> uh, possibly his father too. Right. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we were talking about um, Martin had that intense period of rehearsal after Katrina, and and then you went you went on uh, uh, finished at Noco and went to UNO for a year, and, and then. I know there had been a, uh, an, a, a connection established between the Rotterdam Conservatory and New Orleans after Katrina. Mm -hmm. Is that what sort of got you connected? Yeah, what exactly. Part of that? Um, you know, I don't think I had even heard of the uh, the Rotterdam Conservatory or, or anything about it um, before. But after Katrina, they offered um, ten students to come, mm -hmm. all expenses paid for a year, and my sister was one of those mm -hmm. uh, lucky students that was able to take yeah. that opportunity. I should mention that Sasha and Martin were both uh, products of the University of New Orleans Jazz Studies program, and we had a we had an exchange program with the Rot Rotterdam Conservatory. So, and uh, they were just very uh, gracious about uh, taking in some of our students because we, you know, the, the, the university wasn't up and right. running after Katrina, so it was a good opportunity. Yeah. Um, so it, it was via that that I actually I went to. Uh, visit her in the, in the summer and we we together took part in the Rotterdam Conservatory uh, summer jazz program or something and right. uh, and that's where I met a specific bass teacher Hein van de Gein, hmm. um, who was uh, played with Chet Baker for many years oh, and, and yeah. later Dee Bridgewater he was leading the jazz department at the time so oh. that was a I got really inspired to come study with him so ultimately I, I, I started at UNO um, University of New Orleans, and then did an exchange program to Rotterdam Conservatory, where nice. I was able to study with him, um, and ultimately graduated from there. It, uh, and you hooked up with some musicians, exactly. Uh, so that so uh, you stay with for quite a while. When I, when I moving over, uh, moving there, I got um, introduced to so so much uh, music that I'd never heard of. Uh, Rotterdam is a very international city, and and. The, the school is a super well-known jazz department, but maybe even more well-known uh, world music department where they have a, um, a really fine, like specific Indian music school, uh, Turkish music school, Brazilian uh, school, uh, among others. So I was able to, you know, mingle with all these different, different students from all around the world. Um, and for the first time uh, heard Balkan music like Eastern European folk music and, and mm -hmm. such, uh, which I had never heard before, um, and joined a band that uh, s started playing this kind of music. And we all happened to finish school at the same time um, and bought, as, as you do, you buy an, uh, an old ambulance, a <laughs> 1983 <laughs> ambulance, and, and, and go for a year on, on the road through Eastern Europe. It's like, that's right. what everyone does when they finish school, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
And these were the balcony players. Yeah, exactly, the balcony players. Yeah. Uh, and how how, ma uh, how much uh, territory did you guys cover there in, in the ambulance? Um, I mean, that year after we finished school, um, uh, we went to slowly to Turkey <laughs> and, and back uh, very slowly, <laughs> especially depending on the incline of the hill. <laughs> Get out. We're going up a hill. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the same year, we were also able to uh, able to go to Brazil and and uh, and the took them to New Orleans too. Oh. Um, and then the years after that kept kind of going back and forth. And so that was a, you know, that was a huge musical influence for me to see the firsthand, the music uh, evolving kind of country by country right. going the further east you go uh, and the different elements. Um, for me that stood out, especially like the, r the rhythmical elements as, as a, for example, Hungary is more still in 4-4 four, four rhythm, even though they have oh, they're right. a very diverse musical culture there. Um, when you get uh, then into like Bulgaria, the the rhythms are much more. No, sorry. Then you get into Romania, that where the rhythms are uh, starting to have like odd meter influence and some mm -hmm. weird dances, but there's almost like a quirky swing to it that you don't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go a little further and you're in Bulgaria, where like all they have really strict uh dances and and different meters songs in 11 8 or 15 or 9 and it's all uh, based on on dances hmm. folk dances and then you get into uh turkey and they have also uh odd meters but then uh microtonal music and and things like this so it was, right. it was really interesting to see this evolution firsthand what kind of venues would you guys get to play uh i mean anything we i mean we spent a lot of time at, as uh, like really free world musicians uh playing on the street mm -mm. but uh w in that way would get so much uh, so many connections to get invited to play in universities and jazz clubs um i mean th what led us to brazil which was also a, uh, an invitation from somebody who saw us playing on the street um they paid our flight to brazil mm. and played for like a 20,000 person stage festival. Wow. Um, so yeah, all, all kind of, all sorts of venues. Uh, how long, how many, how long have you done, uh, worked with these, these folks? Uh, roughly, I don't know, five years, five, yeah. six years. And it was kind of like a slow transition between living in Europe and visiting New Orleans. And then the visits to New Orleans became longer until it swapped that I was living here and visiting Europe, up, basically up until the pandemic. Uh -huh. um, uh, and then since I kind of uh, transitioned from working with them, I started getting more into uh, other uh, like Middle Eastern musics. Oh. There was uh, first an oud player visited uh, from Israel, a Yemeni oud player. Um, named Nimrod, and he he was the first to teach me about microtonal music mm. and teach me some uh, uh, some uh, classical Arabic music mm. or Egyptian music, uh, and then from there there's been uh, two Moroccans in town that I've been playing with. Mahmoud Choki is one of them uh, that have also been led to like further that development and another that I've been playing classical Arabic music with. So it's, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, continues. You're continuing to, uh, uh, I hear, I've heard you with uh, Amina Figueroa, and, uh, and, and she's from Azerbaijan where they have, she said, music that's uh, very syncopated, the folk music is, kind of the. Uh, it was yeah, it was actually uh, the thing that really got me more into Middle Eastern music over Balkan music. And I didn't even know it was um, an Azerbaijani musician, but it was an Azerbaijan Kamenche player that someone oh. showed me a video of, and it's uh. just like that. It just blew my mind. Like, and it's the kind of thing that'll make you cry, and you're just here, you're just like watching. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's just another another sound that tickled my ear that I never heard before. That's kind of what got me into the uh, Balkan music to begin with, because I have no idea. They asked me to like, oh, just just follow your ear and play along with it, and all I am, my ears hearing. Tah! <laughs> what do you mean? Follow, follow the melody. Ear, ear trouble, yeah. 
so you really got um, uh, maybe not quite right to call it a bandstand on the bandstand, but a real practical uh, on the pavement education mm -hmm. in a, a wide range. Mm -hmm. of music. Has this sparked your interest in writing? Uh, like writing music? Music, well? yeah. Certainly. Um, I maybe I don't do as much writing music because uh, I, f I feel like I'm playing often, so often as, as a, as a sideman with different right. people and still learning so much. Um, but definitely, I mean, that and, and also my sister's influence into electronic music has kind of um, coaxed some of my own compositions to have a, have a combination of, of, of uh, the electronic elements with like solo bass and unusual techniques and things mm -hmm. like this. Steve, I, I, I know you had the uh, opportunity to study with one of the great guitar teachers, Hank Mackey. Mm -hmm. Was that one of the uh, things that sort of uh, guided you and maybe to the longtime duo you had with Ellis Marcellus at yeah. Tyler's into teaching? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, H Hank was when I was, I guess I started picking up the guitars, at, you know, in my late teens, and you know, I actually started on uh, bass in a rock in a rock band, but then I picked up the guitar because I wanted to learn how to compose and I wanted to learn about chords and things like that. And of course, I knew nothing about anything because I was just basically self-taught at that at that point, you know. And I remember uh, I picked up the guitar and, and I came up with this chord, you know. And I was thinking, wow. I invented that chord, and I went to Hank Mackey. Say, that's a major seven six nine chord. You know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> God, it's been around for a long time. Oops. <laughs> so anyway, so I went to Hank when I like I think I was about seventeen years old, and uh, he was sort of like the uh, the resident guru, especially for guitar players in in the city of New Orleans, and he knew a lot about theory and stuff like that. So he kind of straightened me out. And it was it was really good because my my listening was pretty limited. In terms of you know, I was listening to people like Larry Coryell, which was one of my first actual guitar influences, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, Hank just turned me on to some, you know, Joe Pass, uh, Wes Montgomery, and Pat Martino. I remember he had these records like this uh, Four Django uh, record that he he lent me and said, "Guard this with your life," you know, because <laughs> at that time, you know, it's like yeah. records were very expensive, especially for somebody like me, right. you know, and then. Uh, uh, you know, in fact, in fact, I would what I would do is get the record uh, from Hank, and I had a real, a real tape recorder at home, so I would record the records, and then I would give the record back to Hank. You know, <laughs> but I can remember just the first time I heard Joe Pass; it was just amazing. You know, the music sounded a little jazz music of what he was playing sounded a little dated to me, but it was like when he started playing, and it's just like, whoa, how is he doing this stuff? You know, it just freaked me out. You know. And uh, so it was really important that Hank kind of like, str you know, you know, propelled me into a certain direction of hearing other people I, I probably wouldn't have been exposed to. And then from there, I went to Berklee College of Music for a while and then uh, came back. And then long story short, you know, um, yeah, there was a, there was a jazz club uh, in New Orleans. There's always like one major jazz club at any one time. There was Lou and Charlie's, which is where I played my first uh, jazz gig but then Tyler's beer garden was like one of the, the you know the prominent uh, uh, jazz clubs in New Orleans and the owner uh, Fred Laredo uh, liked to put together people you know and uh, I said well you know Ellis had been playing there I think solo piano and I'd been playing there with different combinations of musicians you know it's like house band or whatever and he says I want to put Steve and Ellis together you know and I remember <laughs> neither one of us thought it was a good idea you know putting guitar and piano together you know and uh, but we we uh, we did it and started doing like at least two nights a week at Tyler's for almost three years you know and it was just really great because I had the seventh string and I was able to play bass lines for him while he was playing and he was right. able to play bass lines for me while I was playing, and um, this, there's some bootleg tapes, you know, uh, around that f my friend Phil Degree had a state-of-the-art cassette <laughs> recorded. He would come out <laughs> and record us, and he, 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 he documented uh, Ellis, for sure, sounded fantastic. I mean, I just, you know, it's probably the height of his playing at that time, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about the, uh, the uh, early 80s. Um, yeah, so from there, I, we, Ellis and I had a really great uh, relationship. And then, you know, when he finally started the jazz program at the University of New Orleans in 1989, uh, he invited me to come 
teach the guitar players or the guitar players, the way he would he would <laughs> refer to them. Right. And uh, so I've been at L, you know at UNO ever since uh, up until July of this year. Yeah. But yeah, Ellis it was a real you know that was like getting my PhD in jazz, playing with guys like that and Red Tyler and all you know the Turbentons and uh, right. those are the people I was playing with at the time. You know, and you just learn a lot by playing from different people. Yeah, that Red was such a a great artist, yeah, and just Red, such a wonderful guy. He knew thousands of tunes too. Man, just uh, yeah, most uh, Jason tunes, Marcellus you know? told me that uh, Ellis had said Red knew the most tunes of anybody yeah. he'd ever known. Oh, I know, it's unbelievable. You know, I learned this tune by Bill Evans called Comrade Conrad, which is like <laughs> one of the hardest tunes you could ever play. It's a, it goes from four four three four, and it's 196 bars long because wow. it, it changes key, goes through all 12 keys. You know, but. Wow. I learned that from Red, and uh, yeah, some great tunes like uh, oh, I don't know, just yeah, he he knew he, he knew endless amounts of tunes. You know. So both you guys guys in different ways have had uh, a lot of great experiences uh, that help form, uh, sort of solidify your your foundations as musicians and uh, for you as an educator. Mm -hmm. right? Begin to probably talk with Ella some about the the ideas that he had about jazz education. Yeah, well, like like you mentioned before, I mean, Ellis was was not. A, guy, a teacher that would spoon feed stuff to you. He he was very he was very much a, a proponent of you discovering things, right. you know. And you know, like it's, you want to you want to sound like uh, Oscar Peterson here. Take this record home and come back, <laughs> come back in a couple of weeks and see what you got, you know. Yeah, so right. he you yeah. know he was very much about you know you discovering things and then it, and when you would f have problems, then he would he would work it out with you or whatever, you know. But he wasn't the kind of teacher who would just give you every small bit of information, right. you know. And uh, I like that about him. He kind of he kind of just let everybody develop on their own and find their own voice. Yeah, and yeah. and that uh, ultimately leads to a, a, a better educated musician. Yeah, yeah, and an individual, you know. So right. it's not that he didn't have, he didn't have this cookie cutter men mentality. Right, about, right, you know, yeah. Turning out everybody the same way. You know? yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, over the years that UNO Jazz Studies program has really blossomed. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, sure, yes. turned into the one one of the best ones there is. Yeah, for sure. You know, and you've had, but I, I remember also. I wanted to just loop back a minute. Uh, you had a, a period where you studied with Bert Bro. Yeah, Doctor Bert Bro. And I'd like to talk about him because he's been such a, a major influence on a lot of great yeah, artists. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because he 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 doesn't. He passed away uh, recently in, the, in uh, a couple of years ago, um, and he was. Um, you know, he was he was actually a colleague of Ellis Marcellus at the, at the early uh, iteration of NOCA, New Orleans right. Center for the Creative Arts, and he was sort of like the classical guy, and uh, Ellis was the jazz guy. Um, and there was another person, uh, I think Lorraine Alfaro, that was very, very right. instrumental in the in the development of that course. You know, but when I came back from, um, so he was kind of like the resident Beethoven, I guess. You know, just classical genius. You know, and and was a great uh, composer. He did ghost writing for Jerry Goldsmith and stuff like that, right. you know. And, uh, he, and of course, he influenced all of the, the, the musicians we know, like the Harry Connicks and the Marcelluses and stuff like that, because they all went through Noka, so they all studied with Bird at, at one time. Um, yeah, so I, I, when I got back from Berkeley, I was trying to simulate what I had learned. There was a lot, of, a lot of confusing things about the arranging and composition and stuff like that. and. I was talking to uh, my friend Ed Wise. Uh, he was a guitar player, uh, and he said, "Well, listen, you should study with this guy. He's supposed to be like one of the heaviest composers in town." So I started taking private lessons with him. Mm. You know, at Noka, I used to go to Noka as a private student. You know, and uh, yeah, it was he was very very inspirational. I learned a lot about music and uh, especially on the classical side. You know, but he was he was really inspirational. Yeah, well, well both both you guys have um, had a hand in. Designing and and or building instruments, mm -hmm. and our, our next segment, I want to talk uh, a little bit about those efforts. But for that, let's let's get a couple yeah, more yeah, tunes. Yeah. We have, a, we have a, a rendition that we do with Sasha uh, of uh, Saint James and Infirmary. So, but uh, I'm going to let Martin do something up front. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Beautiful take on a New Orleans classic, St. James and Fumery Blues. I know uh, Steve, you've been playing seven string guitars a long time. How did that get started? Got started because uh, they were very well. I got an opportunity to play with uh, Bucky Pizzarelli. Ah. It was uh, the Hyatt Regency Hotel way back, back in the, I guess, the late. 70s, maybe early 80s, they had a jazz club there, and um, he came to town, and Bucky was one of the few jazz seven-string players, uh, George Van Epps probably being the first, uh, and probably the most famous, and um, we had like a little sort of get-together back room, I was teaching at a place called the World of Strings with Hank Mackey, and uh, we had sort of a little uh, Saturday guitar ensemble. We would get together, you know. Uh, I think Emily Remler would be there, and, and uh, uh, Phil and Hank, and and anyway, we invited him over to come play with us, to hang with us, you know. And he had that George Van Epps uh, seven-string guitar. And when I heard that low note, man, you know, it's just like whoa. That sounds incredible, you know? Because <laughs> I had started like Martin, I started on bass, so I was kind of in tune to the low, low end of the instrument too, you know? And uh, so when I heard him do that, it was like, whoa, I gotta get one of those things. But there weren't any seven strings to be had, you know? Um, it was only one that was ever made. It was by uh, the Gretsch company. Um, and um, I was still going to Berkeley at the time, and uh, I went uh, on one of my, uh, you know, weekends off or whatever. I went down to New York and they had a pawn shop and, and up, lo and behold, up on the wall, there was a George Van Epps seven string guitar wow. for $250. You know? <laughs> and that was a lot of money back then yeah. for me, you know. So anyway, that was, uh, that was really my first uh, seven string guitar. And since then, I've been playing seven string guitar, but the problem is you couldn't find, you know, nobody built seven string guitars. That was the only one that was ever made. So. When I started to outgrow it, I, uh, you know, uh, enlisted one of the local luthiers, a great, fantastic guitar player and also guitar luthier, Jimmy Foster. Oh, yeah. And uh, I wanted to build me a guitar. And I was thinking, well, if I'm going to build a guitar, I want to build it my way, you know. And it had this really long neck that went way lower, went into the baritone range. And uh, he called it a rocket ship, you know. <laughs> so I don't want to build any more rocket ships, you know. And anyway, that was the guitar I had uh, initially. Uh, it's one I designed and Jimmy Foster built for me. 
So from that point on, I was basically, you know, designing my own guitars and having people build them for me. And this is the latest iteration. Here is my latest guitar, which was um, uh, I designed, and a guy in, on the North Shore named uh, Louis De Paquet built the guitar for me. And um, I specifically wanted a green because I always wanted a green guitar. <laughs> As I like to like things the color as green. they are on the green yeah, guitar. Yeah. So anyway, yes. I think he, I think he did a really really nice job. You know, so uh, shout out to Louis De Paquet. Yeah. Uh, well, you also invented that pick you use. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is something I've been using. Um, there was another great influence of mine, um, kind of a little-known gu gu guitar player. That not many people know about him except the guitar players, but he's kind of a legendary figure. His name was Lenny Bro. Yeah. And Lenny Bro, uh, he was sort of a gypsy figure. He'd kind of come to town and show up at different places around the country and stuff like that. And um, I got an opportunity to play with him two times in my life. I once when I, when I was in my early 20s, and um, the last time I played with him was actually, unfortunately, about six months before he died. But um, Lenny used a traditional Nashville thumb pick when he played, and he had these, you know, he could do these, these things called uh, cascading harmonics, which I never heard before. Uh, kind of makes the guitar sound like a harp, you know? It's just, it's just an amazing sound, you know, and it just the, having the thumb pick made it a lot easier. And Lenny had flamenco technique, and he, he would use all five of his fingers. But I couldn't use a Nashville thumb pick, so I had to come up. I was using, like, normal flat picks, and uh, uh, I had to come up with my own version of it, which I call a switch pick, because when I hold it like a pick, this, the arm doesn't come in contact ah. with my thumb, and then I sli slide it up my finger, yeah. uh, my thumb, and then it catches as a thumb pick. So I, I'm constantly kind of going back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, from flat pick to spring pick. But uh, anyway, that's, and then, you know, of course, in terms of inventions and building stuff, I built a keytar, you know, which was, <laughs> that was a uh, kind of crazy instrument back, way back before in MIDI, before there was, uh, uh, well, before, the, before MIDI, you know, and, and I wanted to be able to play a synthesizer and do all these crazy things. So I built this instrument, which I call the keytar. And, uh, and it's not the Yamaha version of a guitar, which is made for piano players. It's, right. it's my version was a guitar instrument and had little keys for every fret, string fret location. And I got a telephone cable with 50 wires in it, and I soldered it to every <laughs> note on the keyboard and, uh, and to every corresponding note on, on the uh, thing. And that was uh, my guitar, wow. which I used to play. Uh, it's still around. I still have it. Just, uh, uh, I bring it out on special occasions, like when we do some crazy electronic music, you know. But yeah. the person who's really taking that job over now is him, because he's building his own instruments. Uh, he has all kind of crazy instruments, uh, practical instruments for travel, for sure. You know. Tell yeah, I want to talk about that. But first, this this instrument. What vintage is this bass, <coughs> Martin? Um, this was the 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 bass that I've had ever since I upgrading from the the Richard Moton bass, uh -huh. which I actually did buy kind of the, in the end of high school on eBay, <laughs> <laughs> back when you could find certain things on eBay for only eight hundred dollars, which is really cheap. Oh, it's for unbelievable! An yeah. Um, at the time, it was all uh, it needed a full restoration. So uh -huh. I mean, I kind of knew that to begin with. It arrived in a cardboard box. <laughs> <on it. laughs> Um, they don't have that one just all the time at UPS. <laughs> no, exactly. Base, give me the base box. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I had I had local uh, luthier Sal Giardina do the first restoration on that, but uh, there's no label on it. But it's assumed around 1920s. No, you so know, this. Yeah. Um, well, it, you uh, draw a beautiful sound from it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but and you have gone on uh, and invented a travel. Uh, the Z, what do you call it, the Z bass or Z? Yeah, the, I'm calling it the Mobile Acoustic Z because oh, acronyms Maz M A Z. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, because of all the all the traveling that I've done, I've always needed, you know, a solution to traveling with the basses. And this one actually, I had it uh, converted to a removable neck for oh. the purpose of going oh, overseas and making that easier. But it still broke once in flight, uh. even with the even with the removable neck, and it's still big and very cumbersome. So I was trying to find the solution that I could still travel in Europe and 
you know, without the ambulance, basically. <laughs> right. um, so I've always, you know, ever since um, basically Katrina and, and, and exploring the internet, early internet of different weird instruments and finding crazy electric upright bases and seeing things in different shapes. And I've always thought like, wow, well, you can kind of like design all uh, crazy things. Uh, and I was always looking for a perfect travel base, but basically uh, unable to find something just suited for me, I had to resort to building it, um, which has kind of been one of my dreams. I've always been interested in luthier work. Uh, and this was kind of like the catalyst that pushed it forward. Um, so at the moment, I've built two different uh, small, they're, they're very small bodied, um, with the, with the the goal is to get them on board an airline in the, in the overhead right so the, so the it's still an acoustic <laughs> body it's like a thin like semi acoustic body uh -huh. so it has an acoustic sound if I'm playing it at home or with a few people right um, but then the, the neck comes off and everything kind of gets into one small compartment uh -huh. that I can travel with and do you take that on the road have you used yeah, it yeah yeah definitely um, I do I'm still trying to continuing to improve upon it uh -huh. and hopefully get to a point where I can sell them. Um, but yeah, that's been life saving in all of my recent tours. Basically. Yeah. Old, old dad's retired down there. Right, he might, right, he right. might need a hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story too. Cause, cause I mean, it's always a problem for musicians to travel with their instruments, guitar, especially because you always hope you get on the airplane and you hope, Oh, is there going to be enough room to put my guitar up there? And it's like, right. it's always this, you know, you're, you're, a lot of anxiety when you're getting on because I've been in those situations where they take the guitar from and it's got to go through the luggage, you know. And uh, so he had his travel base, which breaks down because I, I don't know how he does it, but he takes the, the head off and the strings and the neck and it breaks into a thing that's about this big. And my, of course, my guitar is like longer. And he was able to get his bass in the overhead, and I wasn't <laughs> able to get my guitar. <laughs> so they wound up taking my guitar, you know, and he, you know. <laughs> Uh, I think you've got a good product there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Working yeah. on it. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, before we uh, have our last segment of music, I just wanted to ask you guys a little bit about the more uh, performances in recent years of the Mazakowski family band. Yeah. Uh, when did that kind of get uh, yeah, the going again? Yeah, actually, it was, right, it was right after Katrina, you know, the first time Sasha and Martin and I played together. Um, I think the first, uh, yeah, well, it was, it was a, what was it called? The 300 Club on Decatur or something, you know? And uh, it was a, a club, and that's where we just cut our teeth, just learning songs and, uh, you know, putting together a program of playing together. And since then, it's, it's been different things. You know, we all have our own careers. Obviously, Sasha has a very uh, vibrant career, and uh, I do my thing with Astro Project and my stuff, and he does his thing too. But when we get together as a family, it's really special. It's really special when we go to Europe. You know, we go right. been to Ascona Jazz Festival in Switzerland, and, and we travel as a family. It's really nice to you know, to hang and travel and sightsee. You know, things like that. You know, while we're playing gigs and things. Uh, so um, yeah, we've done several records. You know, first one was uh, the Nova Nola record, right? Uh, we did uh, a record of Brazilian inspired music, a lot of original music, right. and um, and then from there. We did other things, but the No Escape record was more of a, a New Orleans-based type of record. And um, so, yeah, we, we always, uh, we did a Christmas record, too. We'll probably do another Christmas. Uh, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's Snug Harbor. We were, it was a live recording at Snug Harbor, which was nice. Um, so whenever we get a chance to play together, uh, it's, it's always very special. You know? Yeah, I got to think that, you know, you, you both had a chance to play with all kind of um, great folks, but... Um, it's got to be particularly gratifying <coughs> to to get the family <coughs> band together. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 wonderful. Well, you know, it's funny because when they were younger, you know, I, I was always sort of giving them direction and telling them what to do and what not to do, and things <laughs> like that. And now the tables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> it happens Dad. to all of us. <laughs> what are you doing? Here? What are you <laughs> <laughs> get back over there. Yeah, yeah you're right, right, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know. I, I jokingly say I learned everything I know from them, you know, <laughs> about music. Well, it's a good thing you taught them some things, but now you can get it back. <laughs> right, that's right. Yeah, well, you guys always sound good together as a duo or the trio, the family band, or where, whatever circumstances we get to hear you in. Let's hear about uh, two more tunes, what do you okay. say? Yeah, sure. Let's do... Uh
Thank you. That was a piece by the great Horace Silva called Peace. And we're going to leave you with a song of mine that uh, sort of become a little bit of a, a standard among some of the brass bands and stuff. It's called Sidewalk Strut. <laughs>
Yeah. Sidewalk Strut, Steve Mazikowski, Martin Mazikowski, and uh, R. Silver's piece as well. Beautiful work, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Martin Mazikowski, where can we catch you, Martin, any time in the next 10 days, any, anywhere in town? Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, tomorrow, evening at UN tomorrow evening at the University of New Orleans, I'm playing actually with Mahmoud Joki. Is it will be a good For show. the uh, first... Um, Sandbar? It's not for a sandbar. No, it's not a sandbar. I think it's for musical, musical excursions. It's right oh, the good. Yeah, at the, yeah. That's in the... Um, at the recital, in, hall. Yeah, in recital, recital hall. In recital hall. At 7.30 oh, at p.m. Uh, is that a, a trio or a duo? I or? think it's a full band. If full I'm band? Aware, oh, like five, oh, yeah. Five piece. Yeah, yeah. That's, oh, that's, that is a fun... Yeah, yeah. Fun evening. Uh, Steve, uh, what about well, you? Well, I, I, I took a steady gig at the, <laughs> the Monteleon Hotel, which Martin plays. It's a trio gig. So me, oh, Martin, great. and I usually have a guest, d different guest drummer every week. Uh, this week will be Doug Belote. And, uh, and what then, night uh, were you there? That's on Friday nights. Uh, and that'll be going for the next couple of months. Well, and 5.30, uh, right? 5.30. 5.30 to 8.30 uh, at the Monteleon mm -hmm. Hotel. It's a nice hang. And then yeah. uh, Thursday night, I'm at the Pontchartrain Hotel with Peter Harris. He always oh, has cool. a great group playing there too yeah well all right chances to catch these guys and thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for joining us today for this first of the new series and i hope uh, some of you will be able to join us again in our next session which will be in just two weeks it'll be on uh, tuesday october 4th at one o'clock and we'll feature the aforementioned mahmoud shuki so uh, see you then thanks for being here today <laughs>